Welcome to a new podcast episode of Radiology AI. My name is Dania Day, and I'm the Associate Editor for Social Media for Radiology AI. Today, my co-host Paul Yee and I are excited to bring a new episode of the podcast series. Today, we'll be interviewing Dr. Bhavik Patel. We'll be hearing from him about his recent article published in Radiology AI entitled Impact of Upstream Medical Image Processing on Downstream Performance of a Head CT Triage Neural Network. Dr. Patel, thank you for joining us today. First, I will start with a brief introduction. Dr. Patel is based at the Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where he is Director of Artificial Intelligence, Chair of Radiology AI, and Associate Professor at the ASU School of Engineering, as well as Associate Professor of Radiology. At Mayo, he leads a multidisciplinary research team developing AI models to automate radiology tasks and extract biomarkers not discernible by the human eye, all towards optimizing clinical decision-making and patient care. Prior to Mayo, he was an assistant professor at Stanford for three years, where he was associate director of clinical evaluation at the Amy Center. Dr. Patel completed medical school at the University of Alabama, followed by radiology residency also at UAB, and an abdominal imaging fellowship at Stanford, as well as an MBA at UCLA. In addition to his roles at Mayo, he serves in national and international societies in several capacities, including associate editor for AI and abdominal radiology and chair of the Technology Assessment Committee of the Society of Advanced Body Imaging Technology. Dr. Patel, thank you for joining us today. I will turn it over to my co-host, Paul, for the interview. Danya, thanks so much for the introduction and thank you, Bhavik, for joining us here on the Radiology AI podcast. Thank you, thank you for having me. So you play a lot of different roles in Radiology AI, ranging from institutional roles as director of AI at Mayo, Arizona, to editorial roles as associate editor for AI for the Journal of Abdominal Radiology. Given all these really interesting hats you wear, I'm curious about how you got started in all of this. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in AI for medical imaging? What's your story? Yeah, sure thing. And again, thanks, Paul, for having me on this podcast. Really exciting to be able to do this. Um, You know, I've always sort of been interested in machines and technology. And like a lot of us, maybe it had a large part to why we went into radiology. And I don't have a PhD in computer science. And in fact, my early work was not even AI related. Um, I kind of fell into AI sort of serendipitously. And about five years ago, when there was a big, you know, convolutional neural network boom, uh, I started to become intrigued with the capabilities. And a short time later, I had made the move to Stanford, where you can imagine there was even more buzz and uh, a lot of things around AI and medical imaging was going around. And at the time, I approached the directors of the uh, Amy Center, the AI Center at Stanford, and asked if I just could be a fly on the wall, right? Just do things like go to research meetings, go to the journal clubs, just to learn more about what's clearly a new you know, technology, maybe the fourth industrial revolution. And so I really give Matt Lundgren and Kurt Langlotz at Stanford a lot of credit because they really welcomed me um, uh, very openly, got me involved, and were very supportive. Uh, And it didn't take long for me to sort of fall in love with not just, again, the capabilities of AI and what it could do in terms of this potential, but really sort of the computational science. And so I got involved with one uh, project, and from there, it just kind of took off. And I decided, you know, I wanted to invest in this field. I wanted to... Uh, go all in. So I pivoted all my work towards AI and I taught myself Python, started coding and sort of the rest is history. So it's, it's, it's always nice and fun when you kind of stumble on something and it, and it hits your passion uh, and then everything is, it doesn't feel like work anymore, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, thanks for sharing your story. I think that's super inspiring because um, I remember back to when I was a resident and I had first started hearing about AI at first it was really intimidating because, you know, I would look up things about deep learning and I'd see all these tutorials that get really heavy in math. And as someone who also doesn't come from an engineering background, I found that it could be um, pretty difficult to know where to start. But I think it's been really cool to see how your career has really blossomed and just taken off, even from starting off as, um, like you said, being a fly on the wall. And so, um, speaking of how your career has taken off, you recently published a paper in our journal titled Impact of Upstream Medical Imaging Processing on Downstream Performance of a Head CT Triage Neural Network. And the purpose was basically to investigate the impact of upstream image processing, such as the number of x-ray projections in a CT, and 
uh, image preprocessing on a convolutional neural network's performance for triage of abnormal head CTs. Can you talk to us a little bit about what led you to study this topic, how you studied it, and what your main findings were? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I just you know want to take an opportunity that to say that I had a great team at Stanford uh, that I had a privilege to work with on the project, and you know they're listed as co-authors, so I won't name them all here in case I forget somebody. And they put in a ton of hard work, so just want to acknowledge them and. Um, you know, just take the time to also say we're very thankful to uh, the journal Radiology Artificial Intelligence for really allowing us to uh, have an avenue through which we can showcase our work. So at the time that we were thinking about this study, you know, we kind of all knew uh, anecdotally that CT acquisition parameters and reconstruction may affect model performance. You know, we, we kind of knew that models can be trained on a data set from a single institution and because of domain adaptation, they might not necessarily have that same and high performance at another site, again, due to differences in imaging protocols. And we were also curious, well, what if we look at this entire imaging ch chain and look at the upstream part of it, you know, what would putting a model at the point of image acquisition look like? Can that occur in a way that, let's say you've got a patient on the scanner, they're being imaged, could you put a CNN there and it automatically come up with a diagnosis or recognize artifacts so that you can do something additional without, you know, the conventional method is the patient's off the table. You realize something after the images are reconstructed and say, oh, you know what, I might need to bring the patient back or the study suboptimal. So with that in mind, we said, let's start exploring some of this. So the first thing was we wanted to determine, let's just look at the imaging parameters and how they affect some of the downstream convolutional neural tasks, um, neural network tasks. So we used a head CT data set uh, of just under 10,000. And we first, uh, as a baseline model, just trained a head CT triage model using a dense net architecture um, for normal uh, versus abnormal. And that model performance achieved a 0 0.84 uh, AUROC. But again, that was really just a baseline model. What we really wanted to see is how does that model behave when we start uh, making some changes uh, in image reconstruction parameters. So we took essentially simulated sinogram data and we had to use simulated sinogram data because it was really hard to get the raw sinogram data out of the uh, CT console. It's usually uh, locked up. And even if you have it, there's usually vendor specific proprietary protocols to, to reconstruct it in the image space. But we were able to uh, take simulated sinogram data and we simulated low radiation dose or as if the patient had a faster acquisition. And the way we did that is we started reducing the number of projections on the sinogram data. So we had 4X reduction, 8X reduction, and 16X reduction specifically. And then we took those reduced or lower projection sinogram data and reconstructed the image data. And we fed those images into the model and wanted to know you know, how does this affect the model performance? Because for us, there's clearly going to be some noise because of lower dose or lower projections. There may be some image artifacts, and that might affect us as humans on how we uh, look at that image, but uh, is that going to really affect the convolutional neural network? So, you know, today we reconstruct CT images for diagnosis by the human eye. Question really is, you know, is there information in the raw sinogram that, that is there and that's the same or even more? So we fed all those uh, low projection data sets uh, into the model and wanted to know how does this perform compared to the base uh, line finding. And what we found was the model actually does just fine, but there was really no change in performance when you start stripping away some of that data. When we fed in the sinogram data just raw to see, hey, does it even need a reconstructed image? Does it need something in the image space? Yet again, we were surprised and found that the model can actually performance task off the sinogram data. It doesn't really need uh, the image space data. And then sort of the last thing we, we did was, um, you know, what we do as radiologists, right? We always window level uh, for better conspicuity and said, you know, it only makes sense that if we window level these images, that it would likely improve the conspicuity of things and that might improve the computer vision task. And sure enough, this is where we found the biggest difference in the AURC from the baseline model. We had a boost in AUC of about 0 0.07. So we actually found that, um, you know, that window level pre-processing actually has an effect. Yeah, thanks for that overview. I think this idea was just simply brilliant because it addresses a lot of the very real and practical issues that we face as radiologists working with medical imaging data in the real world. For example, I've always wondered, you know, a lot of these public data sets, they 
they're saved as JPEG files, but as we know as radiologists, we lose some information there potentially because we're used to window and leveling so that we can see things that might be beyond our perceptive fields. And so I've wondered about some of the information or signal that we might be missing out on when we use these data sets that are already processed. And so based on your findings, do you have any practical advice for radiologists and engineers alike working with medical imaging data, maybe on the upstream end for when you actually curate a data set and distribute it? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a, a very good point. Um, and indeed, similar to us, there's been a few other studies that have shown, for example, things like windowing uh, can certainly help in improving an AI uh, task. Again, after all, it does increase conspicuity for us. So you would expect that for computer vision, um, it's no different. But on your point about data processing, it's a very good one. Um, we know most of the off-the-shelf network architectures taking a three-channel 255 RGB image, right? Usually a PNG file format. And we know that our DICOM data is far from that, right? Our, our images tend to be large, 512 by 512. So often we have to downsize the image, compress the image to, as you mentioned, PNG or JPEG to ingest into the model. I think we certainly lose a lot of useful information uh, through pre-processing, but I think at this point in time, it's just inevitably a necessary, uh, necessary step. And that's why we sort of took the sinogram data and says, can we just feed this in uh, and perhaps not lose any of that information? Um, and it was interesting. We didn't see a degradation in the model performance. We also didn't see an improvement in model performance. Um, and, but I don't think that that's necessarily the end all be all conclusion that, no, oh, no, there isn't more data in there. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot that we're uncovering about potential imaging findings that are there that are unbeknownst to the human eye uh, that is embedded in the, in the image uh, and, and can be discerned by a machine for good or for bad. So speaking of potential findings or features that might be beyond the human eye or beyond our perception, uh, one thing that's been really fascinating to me is the ability of convolutional neural networks to find patterns even when there's just very little data. For example, um, a preprint released by a multidisciplinary group, including investigators from Stanford, along with Emory University, showed that CNNs mm -hmm. could identify a patient's self-reported race, even when the images were blurred or distorted or downsampled beyond human recognition. We're talking about resolutions of four by four. And so your work similarly showed that we could reduce the number of X-ray projections by 16 times without a significant drop in performance. What do you think are some of the reasons for this? And do you think there's any clinical implications for radiologists looking to deploy deep learning models in light of these findings? Yeah, I think this is a very important point. Again, you harp on something, uh, particularly that study you referenced by uh, colleagues at Stanford and Emory is a very powerful study. And I think will have um, significant implications for future AI work. So I always say, yes, machines can see things that we cannot see. And I think this is a good thing and a bad thing. And let me explain. So here, here's the good thing, right? So as you mentioned, we can downsample an image or reduce the number of projection, projections, or maybe there's an image that's degraded by motion artifact, yet it does not affect the AI model performance. So that may save that patient from getting a repeat scan or getting the diagnosis that they should have, right? Um, you know, we often rationalize things when we're coming up with AI projects. Well you know, maybe I should use this modality or this image because that's how I see it and that's how I diagnose. But that may not necessarily be the right approach because again, machines are able to discern and find things that we don't necessarily do. So we have to be careful that we don't sort of pigeonhole ourselves uh, in a research pathway or development pathway by being biased uh, towards that. Um, and in fact, AI derived biomarker discovery focuses on this very fact, right? To unlock new image findings that, you know, looking at things in a way that we've never looked at before, you know, find prognostic information that we can't currently do uh, today. Um, at the same time, while that's there, we do run into the interpretability or the explainability problem with AI, right? Now we have tools such as, you know, what everybody uses, class activation maps, saliency maps, chat values. So, we want to be able to use these and so we can make sense of, uh, you know, what the model uh, use. Um, and so we, we address that, you know, maybe perhaps with the interpretability or the explainable uh, sort of uh, way or the tools, but here's the bad, right? So if that's the good, here's the bad. The study by Stanford and Emory uh, found that, as you mentioned, AI models can be trained to learn to detect race. 
Um, there was actually another study in Nature Scientific Reports that showed that deep learning models can uh, identify gender from retinal fundus photographs, right? Neither one of these we can do, right? There's no way we look at a chest X-ray today and can identify race. Uh, I don't think an ophthalmologist can look at a retinal fundus photograph and determine gender just based on those images. And so um, this has very significant implications, right? Because if an AI model can learn this, how do we now ensure while we're developing models for a given task um, that let's say we're training it for risk prediction modeling, it's not, that it's not inadvertently biased and using race or gender to make that prediction, right? And so for AI development, the implications are that you have to ensure not only that you have a nice class balance for gender, race, ethnicity, you have to sort of purposely test for these biases. And, and that's not a very easy undertaking. And it's very easy for me to say, oh yeah, you should, you, know, you should make sure your class balance is there and make sure there's no model biases. This is again, gonna open up sort of this large area uh, and, and particularly how, uh, maybe even for us to take a pause before we're readily uh, sort of throwing these models for, for prospective deployment. Um, I'm a big fan uh, of the whole concept around AI model cards, um, sort of like the, the, the nutritional fact labels for food uh, that we get. Because inevitably, AI models, uh, we know they're brittle, we know they're biased, but at least in this way, you kind of know what you're getting, right? You have the data sheet in front of you, you know what it's trained on, you might have some clue about what out of distribution looks like. And so I'm sort of a big fan of that because you know, it, it may be impossible to uncover all the biases, but at least you kind of know uh, sort of the scope of the AI model and what it was trained on uh, to potentially um, avoid some of those biases. Yeah, totally. Um, I recall, I think it's called the uh, Dataset Nutrition Project. Is That's not the models, but it's kind of a similar kind of vein where um, this group of computer scientists and engineers have worked with subject matter experts, for example, SIM with the ISIC for their dermatology um, AI challenges. They basically made these nutrition, or not nutrition, but data set, no well, nutrition labels in the sense of this is what it's comprised of. These are some of the potential biases. And I think similarly, as you've mentioned for models, this is coming at least out as an idea and a concept. Um, are you aware of anything in the works in terms of official from the radiology side, or is this still something that's kind of being discussed as a uh, potential thing to do? I think it's the latter. I know uh, there's a lot of organizations uh, as well as some uh, big vendors that are out there uh, working on this concept and, and really driving it home. Um, we've also at Mayo said that this is something that we want to um, incorporate as part of AI model development. Uh, and it goes back to some of my leadership and, and, and sort of their thinking in that as we're developing these models, you know, we need to not think of model development as in, okay, well, here's our data, here's the architecture we're going to pick, here's the training, let's go validate it, let's go test it, here's the external validation. But perhaps at the onset, start thinking about, okay, let's go ahead and, you know, none of us like doing paperwork, but let's go and fill out some of these things just upfront. What are the training parameters? Um, what is the demographic look like? What is the age distribution? What is the disease distribution? Um, and I think, you know, the FDA pathway is requiring it anyways, right? So you're sort of setting yourself up for success anyways. Uh, and I think that model transparency uh, is important. It might be a necessity for adoption anyways, along the lines of sort of explainability and interpretability. So um, I'm sure that there is more on that in terms of a more formal requirement, uh, but but I'm you know I, I'm liking what I'm seeing just from uh, how it's going on at either various institutions or 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 organizations. Yeah, definitely. One thought I've had is maybe this is not just AI centric, but something that should be reflected in the general scientific literature. Um, I recall an announcement from the New England Journal of Medicine that starting I believe sometime in 2022, they're actually going to require reporting of demographic variables like race, like ethnicity, so that they can ensure that if there isn't representation of underrepresented groups historically, at least that we can be aware of them so we can at least address them when we analyze these studies. And that's a good point. So if we look at um, you know, pulled cohort equations, which uh, is widely used in cardiology to estimate 10-year uh, atherosclerotic-related cardiovascular disease, it is very well known within the cardiology literature that 
while pool cohort equations work very well uh, in a subset of population, and, and I may have this incorrect, but I believe it's a population of, uh, I think, between 30 and 60. And again, I may have the age uh, incorrect there, but also very specific population. And it's been known that it doesn't work so well uh, in uh, the Hispanic population as an example, and certainly uh, the age distributions that are on either extremes. And so does that necessarily mean that it's rendered useless as a, as a, uh, a risk assessment model? No, but at least when you're making your determination and when a preventive cardiologist is seeing a patient, you know, he or she knows that, well, that patient may not fall within the distribution of that model. So let's take that with a grain of salt and, and be careful before we make uh, management recommendations based on that. And certainly what that then does is that then stimulates a lot of work to say, well, let's look at populations where this model has not been validated on, and let's try to address those needs and now validate, you know, sort of purposely select those demographics and make sure that the model is either robust or validated in those populations. So as we talk about sort of, you know, model inclusion and health disparity, and you see a lot of uh, sort of um, work in this area, I think this is the area that I think, you know, transparency is sort of the first part, right? knowing the model transparency will then identify the gaps. If you know the gaps, then you can have a community of folks to specifically go and say, let's address those gaps uh, and make sure that we can have models that also work in, in these underserved populations. Totally. Um, I think those are really, uh, really important and interesting uh, components of some of the solutions going forward. Shifting gears slightly, you recently moved to the Mayo Clinic Arizona to lead AI efforts, both in the Department of Radiology and across campuses with the Arizona State University School of Engineering. Can you talk to us about some of the roles that you're playing both at Mayo and at ASU and about the exciting initiatives that you're leading? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'm very fortunate uh, to be given the opportunity uh, to sort of serve as the uh, site AI director. And, and, and again, really am thankful to my leadership for putting me in this position. Um, so we have an AI center that we established, uh, the Machine Intelligence and Medicine and Imaging. You know, you have to give an, a fancy name to every AI center. It's, it's part of what we do. Um, but we have a multidisciplinary team of uh, clinicians of all uh, specialties, um, AI scientists, uh, students. So these are uh, master students, PhD students, postdocs, but also engaging medical students and then trainees uh, uh, within various residency and fellowship pathways. Uh, to essentially work on AI across specialties, right? So um, one of the things that we're lucky to be able to do is we're not focused just on medical imaging and radiology, but we really get to play around uh, and in these different specialties. So we work with cardiologists, neurologists, ophthalmologists, and, and that's what's really fascinated is, you know, all of us kind of come together around AI um, to be able to solve some of the complex, uh, pa you know, problems that are related to modern day patient care. Um, at the same time, we have a strategic partnership with Arizona State University uh, to bring in expertise from the engineering side. And, you know, my goal is quite simple uh, in, in a sense, because it's really just to bring people together, right? I bring people together uh, to hopefully catalyze and uh, essentially help execute the great ideas that can naturally occur out of such collaborations. Um, in terms of the work that we do, we try to make sure we have efforts on all three of our, our shields. Uh, so in terms of AI research uh, with model development, uh, on the practice side, we, we're trying to bring in models that uh, can hopefully, uh, again, impact and improve the clinical care that we provide. Uh, and then in, on the education front, uh, just being able to provide the AI education to the current and the next generation of healthcare workers. Um, and again, going on the point that you made earlier, which is, you know, really want to reduce the barrier of entry uh, into AI. I think we all know uh, in AI that the more we democratize this tool, the more we can advance it, the more we can come up with solutions to take care of people. And with the plethora of resources and information out there, we need to streamline some of these resources, particularly on the education front. That's a, that's a tremendous um, vision and sounds super exciting. I love how that there's so many facets of the AI initiative, not just in research within the radiology department, but at large with the Mayo Clinic, also bringing in engineering with expertise, working with students there, but also the educational outreach and uh, components. 
And so it's often said that radiology AI is a team sport, as you mentioned, requires complementary expertise across radiology, engineering, and imaging IT. And clearly, this is something that you are embracing with your group and with a partnership at Mayo and ASU. I'm curious, given all of these moving parts, and I think on one hand, it can sometimes be a double-edged sword in that we have complementary strengths and expertises, but I think sometimes that makes some necessary friction, just because if you're a physician, you're coming at a certain problem from one perspective. As an engineer, you're coming at it from the other. And I think just my experience has been sometimes, you know, it's just it's sort of like family members. You might not always be, you're not the same people, but you have to learn to get along. But sometimes that can be uh, a little bit challenging. So I'm wondering, how have you balanced um, and managed to bring all of these different groups together and with different viewpoints and different uh, vantage points? Yeah, well, as you said, you know, uh, AI is truly a multidisciplinary field. So it requires, in my opinion, input, computer scientists, clinicians, statisticians, uh, et cetera. You know, I think it takes, like any other collaboration, um, knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. I think that our role uh, on the clinical side, we know sort of the clinical expertise and what clinical problems to solve. And I think our colleagues, let's say on the engineering side, rely on us to say, well, yeah, we have the computational techniques to do this, but um, what is the practical healthcare related problem that you're trying to solve? And I think when you approach it as saying, it's a great computational technique, and yeah, I don't know much about, let's say graph neural networks uh, or multimodal fusion models in terms of how to implement it, but you do, but here's the problem that I have. And I can tell you that this is what we struggle with in terms of Today, we can't take care of this many patients, but if we had this problem, so we could take care of that many patients. And I think if there's an appreciation on both sides to say, okay, well, everybody's bringing something to the table, uh, that's when you start to accomplish uh, the big things. Now, I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here, right? This is the definition of a multidisciplinary thing or a multidisciplinary collaboration, which is everybody has the healthy uh, respect of, again, the self-awareness and know, hey, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And um, there's no way, in my opinion, that neither a physician who's well-versed in computer science or a computer scientist who's sort of well-versed in medicine can be able to do this on their own. Um, they need each other. Uh, I, d I, I personally don't believe that uh, you can accomplish anything on your own even if you could do a project, it would sort of be a one-off or at a small scale. So if you want to do anything at a big scale, you got to bring people together. For us at Mayo, um, you know, it's, it's nice because I think for success of AI really begins at the institution and organizational level, right? So AI has to be a strategic priority. And I'm lucky to be a part of a large health system where our leadership has wholly invested in how digital technology is going to essentially improve the way we care for patients, right? They're invested in that. And so digital is part of our growth strategy. And so when you have this, it becomes pervasive throughout the organization and it makes collaborations easier because you're just trying to reduce barriers. Everybody sort of knows that, hey, this is an important initiative. We need to be able to do what we can uh, and maybe think differently around processes so that we can all work together. Um, as a health system, we've also got, as I mentioned, a strategic alliance with Arizona State University, similarly committed in leveraging innovation on, on, the, on the basic science side to improve care for patients, particularly within the Southwest and the state, uh, and, and in particularly for the underserved population. So I think, you know, like all fruitful collaborations, it's just making sure that the right people are in the room, they have a healthy respect of knowing uh, the value that, that, that each other provides. I think that's incredibly well said. Um, shifting gears just ever so slightly, uh, one question that a lot of radiologists have, especially those early in their careers, is how do I transition into different roles, whether in research or leadership? And I've certainly had this question myself, and I found your story, your trajectory to be particularly inspiring. And given your mention of all of these different roles, bringing people together, how have you juggled these different challenges and transitions through the years, from junior radiology faculty into a seasoned investigator? now leader of AI at an institutional level. Well, I appreciate your uh, two kind of words. Um, and I think, you know, if I were giving sort of uh, guidance, if you will, uh, to somebody who's just starting out, I, I think I would say, you know, balance 
balancing everything can always be a challenge. And I think uh, balance is a word that, um, or balance is, a, is something that we all struggle with. And, and I don't think that that necessarily gets easier, whether that's things that are personal or professional. Uh, you know, and priorities and interests uh, may, may be different at different stages in, in one's career. And so just as an example, for me early on, one of my goals that I knew was, you know, whatever I do, I want to make sure I have influence and I have impact. And so that seems very broad uh, and, and irrespective of the goal, I think it's important just to have some idea of, you know, what you want to do. What is that? Are you, you know, someone who identifies on the education front, really want to go heavy on the educational uh, uh, pillar? Uh, do you want to go on the research side? Do you want to go on the administrative side? Have some idea. Again, um, not everything may be known or can be predicted uh, at the outset. And so I wouldn't necessarily try to force things uh, as usually these things happen uh, best when they're organic. But my example is I started out in a very different research uh, and administrative role than my current one. Um, and sometimes you may find yourself taking on something that isn't completely what you have in mind at the outset, but again, it may be worth taking it on um, as perhaps it leads to gaining you know, leadership insights or additional skills that might then set you up for even more success when that sort of quote unquote ideal role comes along. And so, you know, these opportunities are, are plentiful, uh, uh, but it's really the guidance that I think uh, helps create the path. And, and again, I've been lucky because I've had uh, incredible coaches and mentors who until this very day I rely on for advice and guidance. And I would just sort of say, you know, uh, for anybody that's out there, you know, do what you feel like it's fun and, and impactful. Don't be afraid to do something that's very different uh, or even risky uh, because then the journey is pleasant, it's fun. And, and, and no matter how many challenges or speed bumps uh, that you encounter, you can, you, can, you can address them. They will come, right? We all know that so, you know, challenges are gonna come. But if you find something that you're truly passionate about, uh, which I've been fortunate to do and some of us that are in AI, as you know, you, know, you, you find something and it just becomes so fun that you kind of, you know, whatever challenges come here, okay, that's okay. I'll, I can, I can roll with that. Um, and then, you know, the other advice is, as you're juggling these things, uh, seek, seek advice, uh, get involved, reach out to people. Perhaps one of the best things about the radiology community is it's, it's, it's one that's very helpful. Uh, and it's one that's very friendly. There's really a lot of people out there that have walked, uh, in, in, in the past that you might be considering. And, and before you're about to embark on something, you might say, Hey, thinking about this, what is your advice or, 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 you know, Hey, I just got into this role. Um, what is your suggestion? Uh, that feedback and that guidance can be incredible, uh, because they'll tell you, Hey, don't do this, uh, because you're going to create a mess for yourself, or, you know what, this is what I found. And this is how you can sort of save yourself some time, be really strategic about some of the deliverables. And again, going back to really be able to make the impact and the influence that you may want to have. No, thanks so much for all of that advice. I'm sure uh, it's going to be super helpful to a lot of our listeners. Um, certainly is for me. As we move into the last few minutes of our time together, I want to ask you a question that we ask all of our guests. What are you most excited about for the next decade in radiology AI? Yeah, and I, I may not have a different or a very sort of unique answer in that what I'm really excited about to see is how the clinical landscape is, is going to shake out in terms of how different health systems and organizations are actually utilizing digital tools that are developed to enable care over the next decade. So, you know, what does a full model deployment and integration look like? Uh, not just talking about one-offs or a few models here and there, but really integrated within a, a healthcare practice. Um, will we achieve that? Uh, or are we gonna see sort of a lack of adoption uh, that might hopefully not throw us in another AI winter? Um, so that's what I'm excited to see is, you know, what, what will the clinical landscape look like? What will the clinical integration look like? Um, what, are the, what is the impact that we've had on patients from a care perspective, outcomes perspective? There's still a lot of complex diseases to solve. If we look at pancreatic cancer, for example, last three decades or so, improvements in the way we operate, the improvements in neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy, mortality rates remain unchanged. So can we make a dent in these types of populations, right? Um, on the AI development side, you know, you know, will there be advancements in the low hanging fruit? So will we just see a lot of workflow optimization and that's what we're seeing in health systems? Or are we gonna see 
again, sort of outcomes-based uh, improvements. And I'll be curious to see, uh, and I'm excited to see how that's gonna sort of pan out over the next decade. Um, on the tech side, uh, would love to see, you know, this, this, you know, AI inference at the sensor level or, or chips, you know, that's gonna be uh, cool. Quantum computing seems to be a buzz right now. We're, you know, are we really going to see that come to fruition and, and sort of address, I guess, the few gaps that supercomputing has? I uh, don't know, or maybe that's just another uh, buzz and fad, but uh, I'm excited about the next decade. I, I think that uh, AI is uh, a part of us. It's, an a, it's a part of all verticals uh, and healthcare is, is no different. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for your predictions, for your time and insights. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much, Paul, for having me. This was great. And with that, I'll give it back to Danya. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for a great discussion. And thank you for sharing with us more information about your recent article and for discussing your journey in imaging and AI. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in to the podcast episode. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our Radiology AI podcast series on any of iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Please stay tuned for the next episode. Please join us in Chicago for RSNA 2021. Reconnect safely with your peers and experience the latest science and education from every subspecialty. Explore exhibit halls featuring nearly 500 exhibitors and a host of product presentations and demos. RSNA 2021 is a hybrid event that includes virtual access to all eligible programming through April 2022. Join us in person virtually or both, just don't miss the biggest week in radiology. Register now at rsna.org slash register. This has been a production of the RSNA. Special thanks to our producer, Kelly Myers, and the rest of the RSNA journal staff. Mm -hmm.